This is part three of lecture seven. So by now, you probably have a good idea of what an, uh, what an attitude is and how persuasive messages work. In this final part, we'll be discussing several influencing strategies for you to know and recognize and be very well aware of. So if we mention influencing strategies, there's only one person that you should know, and that's this guy over here. His name is Robert Cialdini. And Robert Cialdini is the expert when it comes to social influence, understanding and explaining the many ways in which we are being influenced throughout our daily lives. So uh, Robert Cialdini uh, is a very famous social psychologist, and he's also an author of this book called Influence, uh, The Psychology of Persuasion. And if you want to know more about this topic, then you should definitely read this book. It's also been uh, read by millions of people across the world. So a lot of people know his work. A lot of people love his work. So over 5 million copies sold. So you have to check it out for yourself. But for now, uh, I will just give you a short summary of uh, his book and uh, the different uh, influencing strategies that he uh, discusses in the book. There are six of them. Here you see them. Reciprocity, consistency, liking, scarcity, authority, and social proof. So I will discuss them one by one and give you examples of how these influence influencing strategies work. Um, so let me start off with the first one, reciprocity. And I'll do so by asking you a question. So if you go out for dinner and you uh, had a nice meal and then afterwards you receive the bill with some mints on it or some sweets, happens quite a lot, right? Do you like it if that happens? Yeah, do you like it? I guess you do. And what about politicians that hand out free flowers before election day? Do you like that? Or do you feel maybe a little bit influenced by that. Um, if that is the case, if you feel influenced or even a little bit manipulated, you should, because they are manipulating you. And not only the politicians uh, in their uh, red jackets, but also the restaurant owners offering you free mints at the end of the meal. Because research shows if there are very cheap mints with your bill, these mints really don't cost a lot for the restaurant owners, the chances of you giving a large tip really significantly increases. So you give a, a lot higher tip if you receive mints with your bill. Why is that the case? Well, that is the case because the principle of reciprocity is used. Reciprocity happens the moment we get something for free. So, for example, free samples in the city when you're walking around and you get a, a free a can of soda uh, offered to you, uh, then you're like, oh, okay, this is a free, free product. And we love free products, especially Dutch people, we love free products. Um, but they don't actually come uh, for free because there's something psychologically happening to you once you receive something that you didn't pay for or you don't feel like you really owed that or you didn't order it in case of the mints. Because what happens is the moment you get a free free gift from someone um, that you don't know. So for example, a stranger in the city offers you a free product. Then we feel uh, some sort of guilt. We don't want to owe anyone anything. So we want to restore the balance. And how can we restore the balance? Well, in the case of mints, you can uh, increase your tip. So that's one way of getting rid of this feeling of, of guilt. Uh, and also for the politicians, what they of course hope for is that uh, you then feel pressured or you know, inclined to vote for the party with the red jackets. Because uh, that's of course in the end what they are after. So reciprocity can be used in a very small, smart way, uh, giving you something for free, but in the end it's actually uh, a manipulation for you to change your behavior and uh, do something back, which is oftentimes much more costly. So this idea of reciprocity is actually uh, something we discussed before and something we saw before. It is based on the principle of consistency. We also talked about this, of course, in lecture six extensively when we talked about the cognitive dissonance uh, theory. So uh, once we show a certain behavior or once we do something, we want to stick to that uh, uh, stick to that behavior. So we want to be consistent. So this is uh, also used with the lowballing technique that we discussed before. Once you agree to do something, you you know uh, uh, continue um, even though. Uh, the costs increase and you're actually you know, being manipulated into a deal that you didn't uh, sign up for in the beginning. Another technique that has also a lot to do with this feeling, uh, this desire to be consistent is the foot in the door technique. 
which is very similar technique to the lowball technique, but there's a difference. So in a foot in the door technique, you agree to do one thing that is actually a small thing, and then you get a second request, a much bigger request. And because you said yes to the small thing, you are inclined to also say yes to the bigger thing. So this happens, for example, if someone comes at your doorstep and asks you, so do you maybe want to make a small donation for my good cause? Maybe you have some spare coins laying around and you can donate them. Most people would say, yes, of course, I'll just look for some coins and here you go. Then, if this person uh, on your doorstep is smart and using uh, the principle of consistency, what they de can then say is, oh, wow, I see you really care about this good cause and you're looking all these coins to, to donate. Well, that's beautiful. You must be really, uh, really uh, 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 very passionate about this course. So what do you think about becoming a monthly donator? And then you can really make a difference. Well, if they started off by saying, do you want to become our monthly donor? You would have probably said no. But because you already agreed to do something small, you want to be consistent. You want to you know, follow up on that. So we want to be predictable people, right? Rational uh, people that uh, stick to their ideas. So once you get someone to uh, agree with a small thing, they're more likely to also agree with a bigger thing because you have a foot in the door and you just remind people that they want to be consistent and they have the desire to be uh, reliable people that make you know, smart decisions. Okay, so the next principle is the principle of liking. And that is very straightforward. We prefer to say yes to people, to requests of people, of people that we like, that we know, and also that we find attractive. So, for example, uh, the request of a friend. We don't like to say no to friends. And that's why all these strategies like bring a friend promo. If you bring a friend to your gym, for example, you get a discount as a member. That is very smart. That's also something that Cialdini would, uh, would use uh, if he would, have, would own a gym. Because uh, these gym uh, owners know that it's very hard for them to recruit new members themselves. It's way easier for them to have the existing members, you know, recruit members for them. Because if a friend asks you, do you want to come to my gym? It's really nice there. We are way more likely to do it than if a stranger asks us to do so. So we also, and again, we saw this before, we like to agree to beautiful people. So that's again why beautiful people are in commercials, because we like them and we want to agree with them. We want to say yes to them. So that's the principle of liking. Then we'll continue with the next principle, and that's the principle of scarcity. Get it while it's hot. There's only a few items left, uh, you know, strategies like this. So this happens uh, also often very subtly, and you should be very aware of this. For example, let's imagine you're contemplating buying a new phone. You're browsing the internet, and you find the phone that you, you know, think of buying. And then you see the following message. There's only one product left. This is very smart use of marketing because you see, you know, only one pr uh, product left and, you know, that's the phone that you thought of buying. So this is using scarcity principle when there's very little, little of it. It must be really popular. So you need to buy it as well. So you also, this is also often used, for example, when you're uh, trying to book a hotel room. You see all these, these marketing principles, right? So you see how many people are currently looking at this hotel room. You see that only today is a very special limited offer. So you need to make a decision today. So scarcity, the idea is if something is scarce, it's probably valuable. And also we have uh, this idea that uh, the moment something is scarce, we may not be able to purchase it if we wait. And this is very smart because this is uh, sort of uh, tuning into our feelings of reactance. So the moment we feel like we may not have the option to buy the iPhone if we wait for one more hour, this goes, gives us a feeling of psychological uh, resistance. We don't like it. We like to be f free in our decisions. So we, we like to be, uh, make our own choices. And if we feel like a certain choice option is no longer possible if we wait too long, then this gives us this tendency to buy very quickly. And that's, of course, what all these, um, these marketeers are after, for you to really quickly buy the iPhone and book the hotel room. So don't be fooled by these strategies. They're oftentimes just scarcity uh, mechanisms in the making. Uh, so let's now continue to uh, a very big, actually, social influence tactic, something we'll return to in the next lecture uh, way more elaborately. That is the principle of authority. So if an expert claims to you know, know something or sell you something, we're more likely to be convinced. 
So again, this is in line with what we talked about before. A credible source is more likely to persuade you. But here also, you need to be very aware. So you have to uh, keep in mind that sometimes an expert is not really an expert. Like here you see, for example, influencers do this a lot. Uh, here you see Kim Kardashian. She sells appetite-suppressing lollipops. Really? <laughs> Would that work? And uh, does she really know what she's doing? And does she have maybe a stake in this? Maybe she gets a lot of money, you know, making selling this product. So even a lot of people, especially influencers, claim to be experts on something and you have to be critical. You know, are they really experts? And also, does it really matter? So for example, here you see a professor trying to sell you a washing powder or something. That doesn't make any sense, but just seeing this white coat, seeing the term professor uh, is, you know, uh, feeding into our idea that an expert probably knows what he's doing and is easier to be to convince uh, you. So the final mechanism that I want to discuss with you is the social proof uh, mechanism. And that's uh, also, I guess, maybe the most popular and most well-known uh, mechanism. That is used when uh, you are being convinced or shown that a lot of people are doing it. So you, ne you need to do it as well. Many examples of this. For example, I worked at a, uh, at a bar, you know, when I was a student, worked at many bars, and I quickly realized that if you have this jar full of tips, it works way better if the jar is already pretty full. If it's empty, nobody will leave a tip. Especially now Dutch people, we are greedy. So, you know, you need to make sure that this jar of tips is already quite full. Then you have a higher chance of actually getting tips. Of course, the idea here being a lot of people are getting tips. Giving tips is apparently what we do here. So you show people this is the appropriate behavior, so you should do it as well. We're also oftentimes fooled by this. Uh, let's imagine, for example, a club where there's a line outside. Of course, sometimes when there's a line outside of a club, it makes a lot of sense that it's really busy inside, right? But we know, actually, that oftentimes clubs create lines even when it's still empty outside. Also, based on the idea of social proof, this is the place to be. Look, all these people are waiting here to get in. And paradoxically, people are more likely to join a line like this to, you know, wait to get inside a club than to go to a club where there's no line. Because people feel like, hmm, here, here it's going to be really busy, there it's empty, so I'm going to join this, even though it's costly, because you have to stand outside in the line, you know, waiting in line. So a waiting line is also an example of social proof, also used in television shows, especially back in the days in these old sitcoms like Friends, they used canned laughter. So you, you, while you were watching the show, you heard people laughing. Again, um, uh, social proof. So you heard people laughing, which is contagious. So we know from, uh, from research that people find a comedy show more amusing when they already hear laughter, even though the jokes are exactly the same. So canned laughter, another uh, example of social proof. So these, this idea of social proof is all based on the principle of conformity. And conformity and authority are both very powerful psychological tools to influence people. And this is something we'll talk extensively about in the next lecture to come. So I won't get into it um, in much more detail now. The only thing I'll do is reveal to you that I also used this tactic on you in this exact le lecture. While I was introducing uh, the book that I was discussing by Robert Cialdini, I told you it's a bestseller. It's read, read by millions of people across the world. This is also an example of using social proof. So a lot of people are reading it, so you should read it as well. With all these principles, it's really important to stay alert. You know, don't let yourself be fooled. You know, be uh, aware of all these mechanisms that are out there, trying to persuade you, trying to influence you. Uh, well, the good news is with this new level of awareness that you now have, you will be less susceptible to these strategies. So I think and I hope you can use this and make advantage of this while you go about your day. So this is the end of the lecture. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.